This morning on Wake Up With Hope, we have an inspiring Reflections of Hope episode and Faith for Today will join us to share a devotional thought. Plus, we will have a special feature on forgetting our failures. Don't miss it. Good morning and welcome to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for waking up with us here today. You know, we're so glad you have chosen to join us. And I'm together with my son Elijah here today. And you know, Elijah, we have an international audience. So why don't we say a few greetings in a few different languages. It's good morning or bonjour. Yes. Um, uh, que se hey or, oh, in Swahili. <laughs> Jumbo. Jumbo. You know, languages are so fun and we're so happy to be able to start the day with you. So where are you watching from? We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message on our official Wake Up With Hope Facebook page and let us know. We would love to hear from you. Now, today is a very special day. It's another day. What is today, Elijah? Yes, it's a World Plant Milk Day. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You know, it's a day to realize that whether you know it or not, milk, plant milk, is good. It's sustainable. It's an alternative to dairy milk. You know, mm -hmm. plant milk safely provides your body with key nutrients and minerals, giving you strength and endurance to live your life to the fullest. So it's great. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it is. So if you haven't yet celebrated, celebrate World Plant Milk Day by trying some plant milk. The alternatives today are seamless, seamlessly endless. Yes, they are. You have soy milk, cashew milk, almond milk, oat milk, flaxseed milk. That's about, that's a lot of them. You name it, try today in a smoothie or your favorite recipe. Yeah, what, what's your favorite kind of milk? Um, I mean, soy milk, cashew milk. Yeah, those, those are both good. And, those are very yeah. good. So as you can see, there's lots of tasty alternatives and we invite you to explore today and enjoy each one of those. So let's begin by taking a look back at what took place on this day in history. On this day in history, in 1864, the 1864 Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armies in the Fields was adopted by 12 nations in Geneva, advocated by Swiss humanitarian Jane Henry Dunant. It called for the impartial care for the sick and wounded during the war and established the neutrality of medical personnel also introduced the Red Cross on a white background as an international emblem, honoring do not swish nationality. This led to the formation of the International Committee of the Red Cross. 1901, do not receive the first Nobel Peace Prize. And today, Jesus continues to call us to embody love and mercy in all circumstances. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Just as the Red Cross aimed to offer care and protection to all, regardless of their side in the conflict, Christ's love extends to everyone without exception. He calls us to serve with the same selflessness and compassion, reaching out to those in need and treating them with dignity and respect. Will you take the challenge to be His hands and His feet today? Amen, amen. Socorro is a spectacular island that lies off the coast of Mexico. This is a place of refuge for the creatures of the sea where no fishing, mining, or tourist development is allowed. Here, marine life thrives. The majesty of this water world cannot be described by feeble words. It is simply breathtaking. And yet, only a few can experience the splendor of this place. Well, you might ask, why not more? Find out today in Reflections of Hope episode. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you're willing to endure intense suffering to obtain it? Willing to sacrifice comforts and go through hardships just to acquire it. Something that was so attractive to you that you'd be willing to do almost anything just to see it. Well, there's an earthly place that's kind of like that for me. Two 
285 miles off the coast of Mexico lies a group of four volcanic islands that shoot up from the great Pacific Ocean. Discovered in 1533 by Spanish explorers, the Revilla Hijiro Islands have been a top destination for many more explorers since then. It is home to a handful of naval officers who look after the Mexican naval base on the island of Socorro. It is also the center of the largest marine protected area in North America. A 57,000 square mile marine sanctuary, a place of refuge for the creatures of the sea where no fishing, mining, or tourist development is allowed. It is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is called by some as Mexico's Little Hawaii. Now, it doesn't have the beautiful beaches like we have back at home, but it does boast some of the most spectacular pelagic diving in the world. Lava tubes rising like chimneys from the sea floor provide the perfect backdrop for a plethora of pelagic species to congregate in peace. There are schools of hammerhead sharks seeking rest by drifting in the ripping currents. Strong but yet peaceful predators that are unbothered by our presence. You can hear humpback whales sing their love songs while they nurse their calves in the calm and clear waters. The friendly bottlenose dolphins are intrigued by scuba divers and consistently draw close for a playful look. The intelligence in their eyes and their playful personalities testify to the wisdom and joy of their maker. But the main attraction of this incredible place are the gigantic oceanic manta rays. With wingspans of up to 20 feet wide, these gentle giants seem to soar through the ocean with grace and majesty. Their behavior is almost inexplicable. Instead of fleeing from us, they constantly draw near, seeking for a relaxing massage in our bubbles. The eye-to-eye -eye encounters with these graceful creatures are a glimpse of heaven for me. To be in the presence of something so large and yet so graceful and peaceful is awe-inspiring to say the least. Words cannot describe the feelings of exploring the water world of the beautiful creatures of Socorro. And yet surprisingly, there are only a relative few who are able to experience the splendor of this place. Why not more? Well, because Socorro is a very hard place to get to. Unless you're one of the few Mexican naval officers, the only way to get to these islands is by boat. And there's only a relative few boats that bring only advanced scuba divers, only a handful at a time. And due to the rough seas, there are just a handful of months out of the year where the waters are relatively calm enough to set sail. And once you do, it's a 24-hour boat ride to this isolated place. Because of the long journey, there are no day trips. One week is the minimal amount of time you must be willing to stay on the boat to experience the splendor of Socorro. Now for some people, this may be an easy voyage to make, but I, on the other hand, suffer from a terrible disadvantage. Despite my love for the ocean, I'm constantly plagued with seasickness. It is a curse. For me, there are few things worse than being seasick on a boat where there's no place to escape for relief. But despite this, I'm still willing to endure the 24-hour boat ride and seven-day journey to experience the beauty and power of this place. Being able to swim with the friendly dolphins, the powerful sharks, the singing whales, and the majestic mantas make it more than worth it to me. Our journey to Socorro reminds me of another journey that is also hard but the destination is worth every step. It is the journey from earth to heaven. The Bible says that it is only through much tribulation that we will enter into the kingdom of God. It tells us that the afflictions of this world are what God uses to prepare us for the eternal weight of glory to come. And Jesus said that only those who endure to the end will be saved. In order to make it to the heavenly Socorro, we must be willing to sacrifice earthly comforts and endure the seasickness of trial and hardship. But when we get to the shores of heaven, it will be worth it all. The name Socorro comes from the old English word Socor, which literally means to aid and support in times of hardship and distress. These isolated islands have truly been that for me, a place of relief from my seasickness. And in a similar way, 
there is another place where we can find relief from the seasickness of sin. And that, my friends, is at the foot of the cross of Christ. It is said concerning Jesus, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor, to aid, to help, to bring relief to those who are also tempted. You see, Jesus knows what it's like to experience the temptations that we face. In fact, he has already faced the pain and endured the hardships that we've yet to encounter. For his desire to be with us was so strong that he left the comforts of heaven and he set sail to the rugged shores of our sinful world. His yearning for eternal fellowship with us was so great that he made the ultimate sacrifice for us on the cross. He took our sin and our seasickness in order to give us his soothing salvation. And he endured to the end when he said, it is finished. And having been through all of that, he was now able to succor us on our way to the heavenly Socorro. All we must do is look to him for grace and strength. So remember that even though the journey will be difficult and the sacrifices will be great, the destination will be worth it all. Far better than the dolphins, the sharks, the whales, and the mantas. To be with the maker of them all in the unspoiled paradise of God, nothing can compare. And by God's succoring grace, I'll see you there. All of us have failed at something. Sometimes those failures come back to haunt us. Well, in today's episode of Doc Tales, we take a closer look at how we can forget our failures. Have you ever failed at something? Now, I mean really failed. Maybe it was your school exams. You're still haunted by that number. You see that number on anything from house numbers through to the number plates on cars. Maybe you've had a failed marriage, two or three of them. Maybe you've failed at your job and you've been fired. I guess all of us have had a big F for failure at some point in time in our life. Today we're going to the scene of Cyrus's greatest failure. Hey, remember this place, boy? This is your home. Here we are, we're going back to your home. This is the Guide Dogs Training Centre on the outskirts of Sydney. Cyrus was born to be a guide dog for the blind. He was raised here. He was trained here. This was his base. But he failed. So why did Cyrus fail as a guide dog? The official reports say he had too much initiative. In other words, you can imagine him leading the blind person all the way to the mouldy piece of bread he'd sniffed out in the heart of the prickly blackberry bush. Or the end of a carrot someone had thrown out the car window that got him crossing the road on a green light with the poor old blind person taken for the ride. Cyrus was such a failure, he got a name change. He was originally called Willis, but when we adopted him, we changed his name to Cyrus after the great Persian king, King Cyrus. Now, how would you feel if you came back to the scene of your greatest failure? Would you feel nervous, daunted, Embarrassed? Maybe a bit ashamed? Well, let's see how Cyrus goes. Although Cyrus didn't cut it as a guide dog, he certainly has no grudges against this place. It's like he remembers only the good things, the good smells, the, the great people, all that yummy food. He 
doesn't see himself as a failure in life. He's not a failed guide dog. He's just a dog who's shifted from this family to our family. Coming back here, well, it's just like coming back to his old home. Hello, boy. Good boy. Come on, boy. One of the most important lessons Cyrus has taught me is to focus on the future, not dwell on the past. The Apostle Paul, who also had a name change after a lifetime of spiritual failure, he said this, But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. The next time you feel like you've failed at something, and you just can't get it out of your mind. Think back to Cyrus. See the good things from the past. Live in the moment and enjoy what's coming to you in the future. That's how Cyrus here thinks. What about you? Hello, boy. That's how you think. If you're enjoying our program, don't forget to visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up and share us with your friends and loved ones. And search for us on YouTube to subscribe and keep up with us. We have to take a short break, but when we return, Faith for Today will share our devotional thoughts. Stay with us. Thank you. And welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for staying with us. It's now time for a devotional thought. This morning, it will be brought to us by Faith For Today. More often than I can count, people have brought me a Starbucks coffee. It's a very kind and generous action, and it shows me that they care about me. There's just one minor problem. I don't like coffee. I don't care if it's piping hot or iced, frapped, or plain, mocha, salted, pumpkin spiced, or blonde, medium or dark. I don't care if it's from Sumatra or Pike's Place, cappuccino, espresso, or macchiato, venti grande or tall. I don't like coffee. But what about tea, you might ask? Nope, I, I don't like tea either. I don't like it hot or iced. I don't care if it's plain, sweet, tropical, or green. I just don't like it. If you want to drink a beverage made from soaking crumpled up dead leaves, by all means, help yourself. It's just not for me. Now, some of you from the South might be saying, but you haven't had my sun tea. Well, you obviously don't have my taste buds. And it's clear from your beverage choices that things don't taste the same to you that they do to me. It's just me. It's who I am. But if you haven't spent much time with me, you wouldn't know my taste, would you? You would be left only with assumptions. You would apply your own preferences and the tendencies of the community to assume what I like. You would poll the masses of our culture and community and come up with the conclusion that I would be overjoyed with a Starbucks or a Starbucks gift card. And that would be an inaccurate image of me. Now, please understand this. I do not refuse the coffee gifts because the action for me is not centered around the beverage, but the behavior. I don't focus on the coffee grounds, but on the grounds of Christian generosity. Someone just tried to do something very nice for me and sacrifice some of their money and time because they wanted to do something special for me. So I accept it and I re-gift it to one of my caffeine-addicted friends. But you couldn't possibly know that I don't like hot beverages if we hadn't spent this time talking about it together, would you? I'm guessing you wouldn't. Which leads me to share with you something that is going to give you a lot of hope today. The Bible says in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. 
You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Isn't that the best news for you today? God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows everything there is to know about you. Most people would naturally prefer to be unknown. This reminds me of a story that is told of a banquet that was held for military officers and their wives. The commanding general of the base delivered a seemingly endless oration. A young lieutenant grumbled to the woman sitting beside him, what a pompous and unbearable old windbag that slob is. The woman turned to him, her face red with rage. Excuse me, lieutenant, do you have any idea who I am? No, ma'am, the man fumbled. I am the wife of the man you just called an unbearable old windbag. Oh, said the lieutenant. And do you have any idea who I am? No, said the general's wife. Good, said the lieutenant, getting up from his seat and disappearing into the crowd. Many of us have experienced a similarly embarrassing moment like this. So why is the fact that God knows everything about us such good news? Well, because it enables him to do what is best for us. And because of that, we can trust him with our lives and our future. Not only is God familiar with our ways, Scripture says he also hems us in, behind and before. He has wrapped us up in his arms, protecting us from harm. He has laid his hand on you, like a parent laying their hands on their child. This is a sign of their presence, their love, and their protection. God is not distant from you. His hand is is on you. Knowing how well God knows you, knowing that he is protecting you, and knowing that he is near, that has to feel comforting, even though it is difficult to comprehend. God is truly present in our lives. Jeremiah 12, 3 echoes this and says, but you, Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart towards you. So that brings up a really big question. If God really knows me, then why does he have to test me? Doesn't he already know whether I'll pass or fail his test? What does it mean when the Bible says God tests our hearts? Well, here's a little known secret. Every reference in scripture that says that God is testing mankind, except for one, uses a very special word that has gotten lost in translation. Instead of reading the English word test, it is actually more accurate to say refine. This refining process, although it may seem a little foreign to your typical day, is actually something that you need to understand inside and out, and here's why. The Bible, when it talks about God testing us, it doesn't use the definition for testing that we automatically think of. When we hear about tests, we think of exams and quizzes to prove how much we've studied and how well we can answer those questions at a moment's notice. But have I got some great news for you today. When the Bible says that God tests us, it consistently uses the metallurgical term for refining precious metal. God does not test you to see how much you know or to find out where your breaking points are. He already knows you inside and out. He knows the beginning, middle, and end. He already knows more about you than you do. So that's obviously why the Bible doesn't say that God is up there testing us like a difficult-to-please teacher at finals week. He's doing something completely different. He's trying to make you more precious. He's trying to make you more valuable not in his eyes, but in the eyes of everyone else around you. He already values you so much that he paid the ultimate price to buy you back from the enemy. He's not testing to see how serious you are. He wants to purify you, to remove all the things within you that are holding you back from the revolutionary that he created you to be. That's why you might be going through an experience right now in which you may feel like the heat has really turned up in your life. Perhaps this refining process might be reminding you of your past year with all of these extreme conditions incorporated in the refining process. 
Just know today that you are safe as long as you're in God's hands. He can use even these fiery trials to help you become more like him and to begin to see that with each stage of the process that he is strengthening you and healing you and purifying you in a way that will help you lean confidently into the indestructible arms of your loving God. So let him refine you a little bit more today and don't get scared when he turns up the heat. God knows you and he's just making you more precious. Amen. Thank you for that blessing. And friends, thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope. And if you would like to learn more about our program, please visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. And don't forget to join us tomorrow. We will be featuring in other Reflections of Hope episode, a devotional thought and a health feature you won't want to miss. And if you enjoy today's devotional thought and you would like to learn more about the Bible, please visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides. Again, that's hope.study. Study. And of course, we can't leave without sharing with you our daily Bible promise. And today's promise is found in Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. It says, Brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. You know, friends, what are you waiting for? Believe in God and be made right in His sight. Amen, it's a beautiful promise. It really is. You know, we've enjoyed so much spending this morning with you, and we pray that this promise will give you hope and courage to face your day today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how thankful we are that we can turn to you at any moment, at any time, you're always present with us. And we pray, Lord, that you would walk with us into our day, that you would keep us faithful, and above all, Lord, may the hope that we received, please, Lord, guard our hearts. May it remain within us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.